presentation um, and the show that's up right now, and then we can get started. So we are a nonprofit organization, and we've been around since 1884, which means we're almost 132 years old. And we support, the mission of the organization is to support emerging photographers, um, videographers, lens-based artists. So to that end, we have a bunch of different programming. We have our conversation series, which is what you're at here tonight. Um, and we invite two to three people to come and speak in conversation. And generally, it's an emerging artist with another emerging artist or with someone else. We also have a guest blog, and we invite someone to blog for us for three months. We have a zine fair, which this coming year will be in June. So if you make zines, um, stay in touch with us um, any way that you can. Our newsletter sign-up sheet is in the back if you want to send, sign up for the newsletter. We have um, a workspace residency program. So if you are not matriculated in school starting January 1st of whichever year that you're applying for, you can be a workspace resident, which means that you have three months of access to the darkrooms and digital facilities through ICP. Um, we partner with them to use their facilities. We also have digital scanning stations downstairs. And you get three months of access, you get a stipend of $3,000 and film and paper to make work. And then the following year, you get a solo show here and you get another guaranteed $2,000 to put your show up and potentially more depending on our funding. So it's really like a fabulous program, it's free to apply, the application already passed, but next year if you're not going to be in school, I encourage you all to apply. And then we have our guest curated exhibitions. So curators or artist curators can propose a show and the exhibition committee looks at the show that they propose. It always has to be emerging photographers or mid-career, underrepresented um, photographers. So this show that's up right now is called Venegas and Venegas, and it's two Mexican photographers, a father-daughter. Um, Jose Luis Venegas is a wedding photographer, and he started shooting in the early 70s. And so his work is in the show is a collection of archival images from 1972 to 75, and they're around the corner. <laughs> so it's a table and we had to move it out so more people could come in. So if you just, you can look back here at the end of the talk or tomorrow's the last day to see the show. But the work on the walls, um, minus the picture that's here, which is downstairs, um, is Yvonne Venegas. And she has been shooting, um, she went to ICP in the late 90s and then went to school at UC San Diego and she, has been shooting the upper class society in Mexico since about 2006, I think, and she's sort of turning a critical eye um, on that community. And this is work from a couple different projects. There's three of her books in the back if anyone wants to check them out later. Um, other than that, um, I, can't, I think that's about it. Um, ask me if you have any questions. We also have like workspace memberships, so if you want access to dark rooms or like an Imacon scanner, we have a very good rate um, to join as a member. My name is Libby, I don't know if I said that, but ask me any questions later. And um, without further ado... Is I'm there any more space up there where you are? Um, there, there, someone could sit here, but they wouldn't... Yeah, maybe a couple people there if they wanted to. Um, sorry, we're tiny. So. <laughs> we'll make um, it work. Yeah. yeah. There's maybe one other spot up here for caution. <laughs> or if someone wanted to, maybe like one person kind of in the center. Yeah, tall person. Sure. <laughs> I'm going to go back there. So, Jen Davis, Tommy Ka, they can do all the rest. <laughs> so, we're going to start up tonight 
to share my work with you. Um, I will present, Tom will present, we'll talk about our books as well. And before we spoke about just having this open, like a kind of more of an open dialogue too, for the audi audience members, everyone that participants that are here too. So it could be more of like an intimate conversation. It doesn't have to like be a Q and A at the end. So if there's questions that come up during when we're speaking or during the Q and A, talking about a process, then we should all yeah turn. interrupt. That's fine. We're like really friendly. Yeah, I, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Shall I turn on the live room? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm going to start by talking about my work. Um, it's a series of self-portraits that I've been doing for the last 12 years um, at this point. And this is the first one that I made, and this was in 2002. Um, and this was on a spring break vacation that I went with friends. Um, Turning the camera on myself happened when I was in college, just an undergrad. In my last semester in school, I was grappling with identity, grappling with what my image was, and not really being able to communicate that with other people as I was photographing before. And to really kind of get to the bones and the nitty gritty of what I was trying to say in my work, I realized that I had to, you know, have, be, have some kind of courage and stand in front of the camera. And I didn't have an idea of what the pictures were going to be. All I knew was that I wanted to shoot in color, and I wanted to see flesh, and I wanted to see tones, and I wanted to see bread and skin. And this picture particularly was made out of like this feeling of discomfort, where I was on a beach, and it had been a while since I'd been at a beach or in the water, and exposed in a bathing suit. And it was really uncomfortable for me, so I wanted to make a picture that kind of dealt with that discomfort. Um, so I set up my large, you know, view camera camera at the beach, set, put my friends into position. The woman in the right-hand corner, I kind of framed around her and then put the other people in the background and left that kind of vacant space for me. And then I just entered into the work and realized in the beginning that I didn't want to have the cable release really shown. I kind of hid it in every picture. Um, and so the camera and, and what happened now with photography, that it was this outlet for me to start to look at myself and just like, kind of start to dissect myself. and have this real kind of view of how I could never have a voice or articulate anything. And the easiest way for me to begin was to kind of look at myself and think about what societal standards of beauty was, were, and how I never felt I kind of could enter that. And so I was, I was creating these scenes or creating these pictures with other people looking at the body. And also kind of looking at my body and kind of the physicality of it and the kind of how it was hard to do certain things like get up off the chair when I would observe other people doing it. So that's just kind of what thrived the work in the beginning. Um, and also, like, a, a lot of it had to do with discomfort and with about abundance and with about a body and feeling uncomfortable in a space and photographing what those feelings were. I started to think a lot about intimacy in my work, too, and the kind of sensuality or the sensual self. And I wanted to photograph what that kind of felt like or what it looked like, as I realized that this was something I didn't have in my life. And also just observing the physical shifts of the body and using this large format camera and how it was something, how it depicted something larger than life, or like the, the camera, the big negative, and it like picked up everything, all the little details that I couldn't even see with my eye. And I started to think about this notion of privacy versus public, of the private self versus the public self, um, which really kind of drives the work for the, um, a couple of years. And this was the first picture that was made in that place where it was about weight, it was about the body, and I was exposing myself. And I had never exposed myself in such a way. Um, dealing with light and color and setting up a stage, setting up this place with another person, where the light kind of entered in, the light now facilitated something differently. Where I set up this camera the, night, the day before, I saw the light, I set up the camera, I waited for everything to come in play, the light entered into the room, and then it became action. It was the performative self that was being projected in the work. And that's the first time that performance was ever part of my work. And again, like with the light, it was so important for me to cast light in a way that was believable, to kind of create a mood with lighting. So this felt to me the bedside lighting, and that would note a certain kind of emotional state that I was feeling, and the kind of psychological state that I was playing with in my work at that point. 
and also taking risks. And I realized that nobody had to really see the work. It was just for me. It wasn't on display. It was just me looking at myself, me looking at myself in a more vulnerable way. Wow. And also kind of thinking about the interior space and, and waiting for the light to be perfect, waiting for the color, everything to kind of line up to make this kind of perfect image, so to speak. And another thing, too, what terrified me about working was that I felt like what the camera saw was the truth. Like there was something that it had over me that was more powerful than what my eye could see. And so this picture in particular, there was something about this discrepancy between beauty and grotesque and body depiction of, where, you know, the, the beauty comes within the towel that, because of the focal point and the light, it takes on a more luscious kind of state. It looks like a velvet. And then the kind of how the body ripples, and it's like this mass, and there's skin. And that's like this grotesque kind of nature and depiction of the body. So I was interested in playing with those two things. And as I began to work too, I allowed for the camera to see me. I allowed for the camera to depict what the scene was going to be. I switched formats and everything kind of changed where now I had 10 images to make. And it wasn't necessarily my vision. I was allowing for the camera to see and to record what it allowed to see itself. And very kind of working in an observational way. And over time and over making these pictures, I realized what was missing most in my life was this relationship and this desire and this like need for intimacy. And I felt like this is something I couldn't experience. It was only with photography, with the aid of photography, that I was able to enter into an intimate space where I can ask someone to do something with me. And this was a roommate that I had that asked to photo make a photograph with me. And it was so innocent and easy to make, but what happened in the end with looking at the work over time is that um, I was directing my gaze at the viewer. I was like looking at the person looking back at me. And that's something that I didn't, had never done at that time. And it wasn't something that I realized that I was doing when making the work. But the kind of residue, if you will, of, of looking at something over time, this is a little bit striking to me. And I kind of made these little scenes, these sets of working with another person um, within like this fantasy of what a relationship would be. But I was really interested in light, and I became really familiar with light living in this apartment. And I, these are scenes or sets that would kind of take place over time and would change, and so I'd reuse these places. And there's something about the way that the light, the kind of the sexuality almost in a way, or my sexuality, how it was portrayed through the way that the light was projected onto me. And then the agency of light too, and how it would kind of come into an interior space, saturate it, and, and be, be the narrative, or create the narrative too with the work. And I realized too, I was looking at myself, or open to being much more vulnerable with the camera than I could ever be with another person. And that was part of the process of looking over time. And in retrospect, too, I realized what I was doing was kind of creating or placing a beauty onto self, or onto myself, that wasn't necessarily something I could believe. So with the aid of light and palette and control, I could place beauty onto a subject that was not conventionally seen as beautiful. And the, the kind of sexual tension that I was feeling at this time in my life was definitely being thought about and was definitely being channeled through my work. I realized that with photography, I had the ability to ask for what I wanted. I had the ability to kind of use this medium as a license to have a certain kind of relationship with someone. Where again, it's all about role play. It's all about this fictional space of fantasy play that we're engaging in. And now, really feeling my, the urgency of my being or the urgency of my sexuality to come forward. But it was only with photography that this role can be played out. So these were these strangers or people that I met and photographed before and photographed again. Um, and I was really kind of searching for my identity and searching for what it would be like to be in a relationship or this sexual kind of counterpoint with this person. And at the same time when I was making these pictures, I was photographing myself in such a different way. Like this picture versus some of the earlier work was was so different as far as like the pinup quality of it or how I'm really kind of alluding my sexuality to the camera. 
as if someone else was making this picture, as if it was like this fetishized body of somebody that was on the other side of it, receiving this image. Like recording a mark, recording like a mark of some kind of exchange happening with this person. And I, I just feel like these four pictures at that time, and there was another product that was going into it that I was doing simultaneously, but they have a different kind of feeling than the earlier work that I was making. And kind of like fast forward, and there's other work that kind of filtrated into this, to my practice, that aren't kind of being shown tonight, but um, working with men, working with like exchanges of sexuality, working with the gays. Um, and I took a kind of break from photographing myself because I was really interested in photographing the other. That kind of led me back to photographing myself over time and again like about sexuality and what is my sexuality and what is this impulse that I have for relationship or desire. And, and um, out of, I don't know, it, it, I felt like I usually kind of work in a way where I take breaks and I taste myself or I, I'm not really, I don't want to photograph or I feel like I'm being redundant or I'm photographing and they're not working. And I started to re-photograph myself again. And there was something about changing of environment and changing of a relationship and so many things that were happening in my life that I felt like needed to be photographed. And so I, I would photograph myself when I was traveling. I was photographing myself in a new relationship, um, looking at our shared kind of love or our shared space. And these pictures, photographing him as well, but these pictures felt so different to me when I look at them now. And I, when I work, I don't know what the pictures mean when I'm making them. It's something that happens in like retrospect. But there was something about how the other pictures were so forced, and the other pictures felt like they needed to be so sexual, sexualized, because that was like all it was. And so now I'm kind of celebrating a relationship, celebrating kind of a desire and intimacy that we have together, and photographing these moments, and then photographing him as well, and looking at him, and like responding to the light, responding to things that I'm really drawn to. And, and I have a question. You, you were talking about like the period where you have blocks, and then you can't have what? Like block, not block. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, you, I mean, your subjects on the screen yourself, and you did it for a longer time. How can like it's easier now to see everything and think about it, but at that time, because there is a lot of moments where you were not feeling good or you're questioning everything, mm -hmm. and then you stop and then you kept doing, but. All your pictures have different like directions. Mm -hmm. How you deal with this period of not working and then how well, you keep yourself back? I, I'm I, I'm still working. I'm like making pictures, but they're not working. You know, they're like they're not successful. They're attempts at something of progress of moving forward. They're pictures that you know are sappy or sad, or the pictures that just don't have the same kind of, they don't have an agency to them that I want the pictures to have, where, and that's like the problematic thing about making work or making new projects where you have an idea, you have something that you want to communicate, but it's not necessarily working, like for a, a year I've been trying to like communicate something new, but that's like kind of the joy of it though too, and it's like when you make a picture and you learn something from it, or that changes, that changes your whole value of like what what yourself is or how you look at the world, that's like part of the process too, you know? But just like shooting through it and like constantly trying to move forward as well. Alright, so switch thoughts? Yeah. Uh -oh. <laughs> Sorry, it's gonna be bright here while we switch over. Because I did this on keynote. Yes, okay, so that's how I roll. Is that, is that something? <laughs> Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming out. This is amazing. And I just want to. I didn't know I was going to show these, but I guess I'm going to show these too. Alright. Um, yeah. Um, I don't know, I felt like this is a little bit fitting to you. Um, the last year I started photographing my, in my childhood house again. Wow, it's, like, you guys grew. Yeah. <laughs> it's brighter in here. Um, and so I'm going to start this, start this one off with like, um, this is the beginning of the, my book. I just can't, this, 
um, I just came up with a book, yay, my first one, and it's like, Jane also has her books here, just so you know. Um, we'll have, yeah. um, so you get to that point, because I never thought, like, my pictures would leave my computer. <laughs> um, but a little bit about my background is, um, I'm going to skip to a funnier picture, there you go. Um, <laughs> I, I moved here at the end of 2009 uh, for a semester and I thought I would, start, I would start a new year in a new city and it was the first time I'd ever left um, Memphis, Tennessee where I'm from, born and raised and um, before then I was photographing my friends and usually it was around people who were musicians and I was doing this whole um, just photographing other people and just making portraits. I was like more of a portrait photographer and moving to a new city where I only knew four people um, that had their own lives and I didn't, I had no, I didn't have anybody else to photograph anymore so that's when, like, that was like the moment where I really like turned the camera to myself and I thought that was a really like powerful act to do. Um, despite the implications, like I'm a readily available sitter, that's usually the case like when we turn to ourselves, we're really accessible um, and we're trying to figure something out and I always like consider like there's, there's a theory, like the, pop, the camera itself is like this kind of mirror um, to ourselves, and it's weird. It's five years in the running, and then like change. I've, I have a new, I have a curl now. My hair is different. <laughs> I'm still in the same height, but um, um, but I'm not gonna show the earlier work that got me to where I've continued photographing. I'd be brief about it. But I did a project where I had people kiss me and I didn't kiss them back. And I'm technically still working on that, but um, that was like, I started that in New York and I never um, made out with people, bef like with a lot of people before then. So <laughs> it was really great to um, get that going and just like um, <laughs> find people at the bar and like just approach them and say, it's for art, would you kiss me? Um, in that order. Usually, like, drinking would happen, I photograph them all at night, and it was like one of my, um, like looking at that, a lot of things came out of the, that body of work, of the idea of like performance and performing for the camera, performing for myself. I was thinking as the camera as an extension of my body, like your shadow being cast on the street is very, like, the, that's an extension of your own body, your, yourself. Um, and my deadpan face, uh, I, I would just accept the kisses, like, being kissed, but I didn't kiss them back, and um, just uh, the like confusing the role between like being a camera operator and being a sitter. So, like you, you touched upon earlier, I always thought that was really striking. Just to have that much control over your work is to like like your your my role in my own work has not been really defined so well. And this like the book this uh, this is called a real imitation, and so this is like very using like using and being aware of like the different ways of like making a self-portrait, like looking at like painting and looking at um, Cindy Sherman, Saint Kong Chi, uh, a lot of artists have used this and there's like this really rich tradition. And I like when I started doing this body of work, um, I start I started doing this at Yale and I had a terrible first semester of like not making like a lot of like work I wanted to do. And most of the time it was because I didn't photograph myself. I wanted to do something way different than like doing like something that's so expected of me that I got in for and then I realized like well actually that's like what I should do <laughs> be doing. And so this is like the, the more actually the first successful picture I did and it's with my best friend who's six seven. And <laughs> It's uh, this kind of compare and contrast and trying to share the frame and that was kind of reminiscent with the kissing pictures because I had another person with me and was sharing the frame and that idea was really striking for me to not be the protagonist and thinking of self-portraiture is like the artist it has to be the main character, like it has to take the lead role of the work. And at this time I wasn't sure what I wanted to represent, as if I was a character or if I was doing like I, around around this time, there's like uh, Shen Wei and like Pixie Liao and like a lot of like um, photographers photographing themselves, talking about their race. Who, when they make self portraiture, it's about really much about their race or about their sexuality. And I'm gay and Asian, so it's like that's really confusing. <laughs> and from the south, and <laughs> like that's all that stuff that is, is happening and operating. I didn't know how to go through it, so it was just suggested. It's like just do all of it. Like what's the point? Like make. The pictures is what's going to matter at the end. And so 
I did a couple of, like shoots with like a couple of my friends, and I always like before coming from photographing other people earlier is using my friends and family and trying to just like taking a moment of our life and setting it up. And I'm shooting with the large format four x five view camera to like, get your head behind the curtain, and then like it's a long setup, and then you shoot it, and then it's like done. Like, um, but it, it kind of like started to this is like a jumping off point for me to talk about my own otherness as like being um, a minority and also trying to find myself reflected in my work because I wasn't sure if I was acting as a photographer. I wasn't photographing myself as a photographer. Like uh, um, any of Andy Warhol's, you know he's like the photographer and the pictures he makes of his self-portraits. And there's like this kind of language that happens. Um, and then it just like got weirder and I started doing uh, more of our like talking bringing my sexuality, because I never talked about that so much. And during school, there, like my sister outing me to my family. It was like this big ordeal, or at least like two of my family members that I trust. And I thought it was like a good like way to like go get into that, to, to think about like how does my, like I never actually get to talk about like what, what it's like being gay, because I'm a terrible gay person. I've, not that many gay friends, so I don't know how like what that is. So maybe there's a lot of sex that happens. <laughs> and so this is like where these pictures are from. Like oh, I'm like meeting people and like pretending these like situations. Where are you meeting them? Um, school, the internet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Mostly school and the internet. It's like friends of friends, and it's weird that I, um, even with the kissing pictures, approaching like friends and strangers. Um, and being updated, it's like there's like this ready, like they're ready to go. They're like I want to be in your work. Like I don't care what it is. I'm a straight guy, and a lot of my uh, my my uh, the guys that you see are actually really straight, and they're like really like into like pretending to be in this kind of relationship with me. I didn't make a lot of those pictures because they got really quick. <laughs> um, but one of the things is um, that I always associate with self-portraiture is the idea of like identity, and I really try to avoid using the word identity because I think it's very synonymous. It's like this. It's said. It's stated out loud, and I wanted to explore um, a lot of different techniques of how to make a. a Picture. And I want to make still lives, and I want to make landscapes, and how do like these landscapes and still lives operate as a self-portrait? And one of the things I put together is a portrait of my grandfather, and this is like fitting because he's he's been dead for like since '97, and I wanted to always photograph him in my head, it's like and had a way to honor him. And I think like looking in a way, if we're doing self-portraits, you have to definitely look at your autobiography. Um, and where you're coming from in like history, and I want to talk about my Asianness. I also want to talk about being gay, and all, like all those things. Want I want to operate in that level. Um, and these, like, and one of the things that is a weird character, secondary character that came out of these self portraits is like my childhood house. Like that's sort of like this kind of extension. Besides the camera, besides that shutter cord, referencing like your extension of yourself is like the things around me, like could inform. And this is like. My early bedroom, that just now is my mom, and she has a Britney Spears yeah, picture. Like <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to be close to my sister, so she hung that up. <laughs> and I'm not sure. She moved. <laughs> and so this is like the other part of that. And you, um, a few months later, and I'm actually reflected in the television screen. If those of you can see. Um, but she's like looking off the side of my head, and I didn't want to like make these like pictures that kind of resemble one another. Like I'm always in the middle part of the picture. Like I wanted to really change my position and like how do I photograph myself. And like part of the process is like sit, having people, your friends, sitting on the chair where you're gonna sit for the picture. And then I realized like oh, I just want to make this picture because I'm gonna sit there, but this is a self-portrait. It's gonna be like just because you're. I'm gonna sit there, but I didn't change my mind. It, it's still like that kind of thing, and it's part of. I feel like that's like a very typical thing if you're making a self-portrait. Ask your friend, sit there, and then I'm gonna put the focus on you, and like trade places with me. And so those pictures are also in play. Like I consider those to be like a self-portrait. You really, photograph them too? I I did at one point, and then they're just not. I didn't. Yeah, I just like felt they were like kind of. And you know, I'm like going around and like discovering rooms that. Like I'm, but I travel a bit, and so this is Iceland. Most of the majority of these pictures do take place in Memphis, 
Um, some of them do take place in New Haven while I'm at school or in New York. Um, and I just like walk into these situations and have like the camera ready. And actually, and it's good to note that um, I'm switching back and forth. I'm like doing digital. I have a digital camera and then the film camera because film's just expensive. It's like, and I mean, like thinking like my body, um, how like how it fits into a scene. Um, there's no nudes in these pictures, uh, in this book. Sorry, guys, if, if that's what you wanted. Um, <laughs> I haven't done it yet. I, I, it's such a weird thing. I haven't. That's like one of my challenges. Is, like, I want to make a new picture of myself. This is the closest I've, I've done it. And this is my roommate's room. He was gone for Christmas. And I, like, <laughs> and I got naked and just like. <laughs> Does that bother you that you are changing, or you said you mentioned you, you switched to digital? Um, I'm doing both. I'm going back and forth. It's like film and then digital. It's like, and that's I. Um, I don't really engage in film if it's a, an analog or digital argument because, I mean, my understanding and historically looking at photography, like the types of Polaroids as photography, and like I don't think it's any different if you shoot something digital and then you shoot something on a, on film. It's still photography for me, and I feel like that's said something that should be the most important thing. Hello. Sorry for the radiator. <laughs> so you don't think that it's like, uh, like, one, like you don't need one medium for this project. It's okay to switch between cameras. Yeah. Would you do like a smartphone? I've been trying to. That's actually something that's kind of, in my new body of work. I'm trying to make, like engage in selfies, but. I hate it. I hate it so much. Um, well, I'll get to that towards the end. If you're just reminding me, I'll talk about that. Um, yeah, it's like going around in, um, in Memphis. I was like um, shot at in Mississippi, like making this. So there is like some um, some stuff at stake. I'm gonna use correct words. There are things at stake. I just like these cardboard cutouts so much that um, I just love this one. Like it was a, a stupid picture I wanted to make, and it turned out to be a lot more than like after I made it. It's like, oh, this isn't the canon of like what I want to do. And it's, like it's a very easy language to access. Like filling my role as like a masculine person, and then my partner was like this female thing, or like just a partner. Yeah. Um, because it's like being coming back again to photographing myself and like I just didn't want to just be in front of the camera for no reason and just take a picture and then be in the space but like I because I wasn't sure what I wanted to rep like represent anymore. Like a, a growing up has always been in Memphis and Tennessee, it's just people point out like my difference. Like I there's never like a day of growing up like people comment on my eyes or like um, I went to an all black school so they're all like their limiting knowledge of Asian people is like Bruce Lee or Jet Li, and that was it. And maybe the Chinese food place down the street. That that was like their like there's like there's never a moment where I felt like the experience just being a normal person where I'm like being treated just as a person of like who I am. Like there's always this conversation commenting something about my demeanor. Then like when I realized I was gay, like that was a whole different thing. People were like you're very feminine, and, like they say something, they want to say something about your character. And that's been like my my everyday experience. Like I still like can't walk into a marketplace and people someone come up to me and try to guess my ethnicity, which is not like something people should do. <laughs> it's like I'm trying to buy orange juice. <laughs> Leave me alone. I'm, I'm, I'm Chinese. There. <laughs> Happy. Um, and then I wanted to talk about being myself, so like these Elvis cardboard cutouts come into, came into play. And you know, I'm looking at other photographers too, and I wanted to be really about like how to make a photograph. It's really about like for me making a photograph, making self-portrait, like figuring out like how to make these pictures that's, that still uh, are about myself. And that was already in the closet. <laughs> I found it that way. Um, and a lot of things that I started seeing from Memphis that people tend to either acknowledge the, the really racial tensions in the past, like Martin Luther King or um, 
slavery. We still like have the auction rock. We just in 2013, like right before I graduated, they ch decided to change the names of the five Confederate theme parks finally to neutral sounding names like Memphis Science Park. And it's like that ah, took you that long. And so there's like this kind of um, tension of where um, seeing something and it actually means something else to entirely two different set of people. And that's how I felt kind of parallel to, like this preserved place is actually where um, Elvis Presley was discovered, uh, but you wouldn't know that. It's just like this kind of replica, of, like this antique kind of thing. And so it kind of, I like like photographing spaces that operate in two different levels. It's like, I think that's how I felt like people interact with me, because you either think I'm Asian first because my parents and then they realize, like, oh, you're from here. Like, we can talk, like, you can talk to me. Like, there's, like, I feel like my identity or, like, persona shifts. But being outside of like Memphis or Tennessee, right? And like if someone sees not from there, this picture of Elvis Presley mm -hmm. with your work and how you're kind of weaving him in, in the narrative, we can through the body of work, where he's just like strong. There's such a strong sense of masculinity and power in him. And so how does that kind of play when you're putting that in place? Like when you're like inserting this into your pictures and the narrative of it all. Yeah, I think I wanted to like put a bookmark. It's like I'm from Memphis and Elvis is like easily recognized. Like he's always associated with Memphis. I think the other only other one is like Emerson that not a musician, but those are like when right. people think of Memphis and I wanted to point out like I'm from here and like I can talk about it. And I think it's like coming up pretty soon. Um that's a yeah, I made funny pictures. Mm -hmm. Um I'll, I'll point it out okay. when I get to yeah. it. Um, yeah, looking at Lee, Lee, Lee Freelander's uh, book of self portraits just came out and just was struck by like I never realized the shadow could be an extension of like just my body without having to appear. And so it was just like finding these spaces and finding like the timing. And so it's in between like this whole performative aspect of it. It's like oh, turning like photographing yourself is like that's so it's very performative in a way it becomes staged. And that, like, how do I make this real? Like, how do I make this um, closer to what I see in reality, and, like, without having to do that action? It's really hard to do, because once you, like, get the camera out, it's like, there's this, it's staged automatically. It's like, there's really little room for anything to be real, or present myself as real. And then, like, using the shutter cord, it's just, like, hint, like, I'm the photographer. Like, that's the character I wanted to play in that picture. And I like, like, I think of, like, Martin Kippenberger. I was, like, thinking about him lately and just bringing, like, a painter from my painter friends. Hi, painter friends. Um, and there's, he did a, um, Jacqueline, uh, the paintings that Pablo could never paint. Um, it's, like, eight paintings of Jacqueline and based on the photographs of her in the studio after um, Picasso passed away. And I really love the idea of just like, um, <laughs> just a self-portrait. Like, it just made me realize like how that opened up. Like the camera itself just gives us so much room to play. The idea of play is, yeah, yeah. yeah play and performance and fantasy is like, this. it just opens up. Um, yeah, I just, I didn't want to really hide anything that I could find that I thought was funny for me, like a sexual humor, because it's like, oh. And then someone thought I was like, is the plant you? Is the plant the stand-in for you? <laughs> it's like, it's passive, like you are. Like, but I'm photographing it. But, and you're aware, it's, so this kind of slippage of like me not being the photographer, but being a presenter of my own work. Mm -hmm. and it, it was kind of weird, when like collecting these like kind of pictures in the moment where, like, how to justify this as a <coughs> picture, like how do I justify that? In the, using that language. Um, this is in Iceland, and I was gonna, my friend wanted to take a picture of me, and I fell. That's it. <laughs> and like, you a child at home, the rug, the light. Oh, oops. And then, like, you, going back to photographing people again, and like, how, like, that could also be a telling of me being the photographer, like, I took the picture, and like, I don't have to be in it, but I made this picture. Mm -hmm. It's like, really, a lot of things of operating, and this, this whole book was just pretty much, or like, the whole body of work has been, like, this kind of thesis, this kind of, this is, like, my strategy, like, everything's in play, like, it doesn't have to be, like, it's basically, it's like, fuck the series. Mm -hmm. 
snowed a lot. Like that's like my house in New Haven, and like you couldn't get to my back door. But so it's not necessarily about place, though. Where it is, that's my question. Yeah, I feel like I still don't know how to answer that correctly. Like place seems to be really um, random, or like where I am, or where mm -hmm. right, I'm like, where like staying and living for, for a brief period of time, mm -hmm. and it becomes like this, like 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 my childhood house becomes a second, like a secondary character. Mm -hmm. It's like the roots, like Na Nashville, Tennessee, whatever is like the root. Basically. Yeah. Played out in the ways. Yeah. And, oh, and then the, this is a picture um, of like Memphis, like trying to make more pictures in Memphis. Like I just want to make like landscapes. And so this is the site where um, Martin Luther King Jr. was um, assassinated, and I cut out the like, it's a museum now, and there's like a marquee next to it, so I cropped it out and with the camera, and I presented it, and then someone got mad that um, that I could make this picture because I wasn't black. And it's like but I'm from Memphis, like I grew up. Like here, like that's why, like this kind of authorship just became like really confusing. Just making these pictures and then like being told like I can't do this. Mm -hmm. or was it more because you were presenting in a context with it was like arts, or it was presented in a context where it was something like outside of a mainstream thing, where someone on Instagram or someone's photograph? It's a museum. Like how many people go there a day and yeah. Yeah. present it to the world? Like who was like I'm just curious about that. Yeah, they knew. They actually were the only one that recognized that it was a civil rights museum and knew like that was the site. Okay. And everyone thought it was like an outside of a hotel. And it was presented in the context of like school critique and like, it. just mm -hmm. wanting like mm -hmm. I wanted to make like besides all this, there's like other these other markers like I want to look for these things that to bring into history. Yeah, it's like this kind of building my mythology. And one of the bigger themes in my work is this idea of likeness, like. Um, how, like just photographing yourself and then you change your hair the next day you grow like you grow a day older the next day and then you make this picture and it becomes really like that's not that was you mm -hmm. like thinking all of that and so found these twins I thought they were triplets and I was really confused when the third brother never came out so I just made this and became like their third per person and I wanted to to start doing this kind of type of mirroring and false mirroring, because you can tell like the subtle difference between them, like they're, um, they're I guess they're identical, right? Yeah. <laughs> and like beginning to use my sister a lot, and this idea, again, like false mirror mirroring and this idealized self, and like how do we, like if you photograph yourself, and I think this comes into like more of the idea of selfies. It's like there's this the selfies are just this idealized versions of yourself. Like, it's a very mirror of like, what you want to see and what you can't like, help people see. Um, yeah. Do all that. And then uh, five minutes later, I walked into a hill of ants after I shot this. <laughs> Who is that? Uh, it's my uh, f um, undergrad friend, Flynn Lola. She is like one of my um, good friends from Memphis, and so I wanted to like, one of the weird things is that I did, there, there was never like a, a quota of like photographing like my male friends and the female friends, and it seemed like at the time, um, this was, I made this earlier this year, and I kind of weirded myself out, like a lot of um, the other character of my work or the other person has been like male, like, mm -hmm. so I wanted to find someone that was like, she has been, I photographed her before, and, like, Way a long time ago, so it just made sense to come back to her, um, knowing like all this is happening, knowing what I want to photograph now. <laughs> and I wanted to make like the you know masquerade is a big part of self portraiture, like the history of people. Again, that the idea of space and play. I grew that mustache in a day. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and, and like thinking the, the the scenes of like where I was, and I wanted to like this is like an example of uh, setting up the camera and then like putting focus and trying to put photograph myself in it, and then I realized like this is a much better, this is more telling than me being in a bar. It's like this is me at a bar photographing this part of the bar, <coughs> which I think is like really popular. Like I think Christian Patterson photographed it, and like the jukebox like was right next to it, <laughs> so there's like this kind of inside joke happening. And one of the weird things that started coming out of it was like this disembodied head. My disembodied head was... Yeah. Still using people and then photographing. 
So we don't have a Dairy Queen, we have a Dixie Queen. <laughs> and repeating the disembodied type with another person. This is a stranger that works at the flea market. And I think this is like um, showing like all this is like there's di these different strategies, these different things that come into play with the, the idea of like the self-portrait as a, like its own tradition and genre. This is very much like how we form ourselves as a person, as a people, because we're always like changing. We're also with new information, we just change all the time. Like why? And I wanted like that mark when you talked about that mark. Mm -hmm. It was like this is I want to make this. I want to make it too. So I was actually thinking about your picture, but that neck picture. This. It's like I fell and on the steps. It worked. <coughs> All his family stuff, and then this was like more direct gaze. This was like looking back into the camera, looking back at the as a photographer, and it kind of made her cry. Sorry. Um, yeah, I'm getting towards the end of it. Pretty much like that's like is happening, and then it's gonna just go through all my notes, and then we're awesome. Let's skip through it too. So again, like, can you go back to that one picture? Which one? Because this too, I think, is really interesting. How you like, you're really pushing the control, and you're giving it to your mother. Like, she's the kind of, she's the one who has control of the situation here. Yeah. It seems to be like you kind of set up your camera, you set up the space. It's performative, you know. Even though it's like, if I didn't know the two of you and I came upon this picture, if it didn't work, it seems as almost if it's like a domestic kind of partnership that's happening, and like the way of just the relationship of the bodies being turned away too. But then, like this impulse to like give ownership. Maybe you can talk about that a little bit too. How this picture was made and how you felt like she needed to be like the maker versus like the sitter as well. Because she's repetitive. She comes up in your work all the time. Yeah, like my mom is like. Um, I see my mom, or at least when we're together and or photographing each other, or I'm photographing both of us. Um, she's not. She doesn't have any technical skills to follow. Sure, so yeah. usually I'm the one that sets it up, and I wanted her to. <laughs> We have a very antagonistic relationship. Um, she doesn't know I'm gay, and so that's like the like when we were making like getting to the end part of like this project and doing this book was like one of the things like we're trying to link together is like why is this she shows up a lot is to remind myself how much like there's a part of myself that I can't reveal and like and people see me a certain ways all the time and my mom definitely sees me a different. And it's becoming harder, like, each year it's growing, and um, she, she doesn't have access to the internet, she doesn't, like, like, she's not really well connected to, like, knowing this part of my life. So this, like, all this stuff is happening, and she doesn't know it, and, like, comparing all the stuff, like, lying in bed with, like, other men, or just, right, that right. stuff is happening, and I wanted to at least have some sense that we have, like, these kind of calm, like, calmness, like, there's a, despite, like, I'm seeing her as like this kind of villain or this antagonist that we, if she ever finds out, I don't think it's gonna like work out that way. So these are the pictures that we're made, we were made. Like this is the only, these will be the pictures that will be the both of us and that's it. That's like, that's all I get. Okay. Well, stop. My, si my sister being in this is like pretty helpful. <laughs> So that's been necessary. And then I like recreating stuff and referencing, like, and reusing people again. And, um, it's just something. I found this guy because I thought he looked like my friend. <laughs> <laughs> but he's 6'5, so not the same. He's like two inches shorter. Man, I really should have got this. Yeah. And. And this is the last part of the, the, this is the last picture of the book for, that ends this book. Um, yeah, um, uh, I like, I always saw the, I was, we always had this picture on the, you know, in our garage and I never knew what it was and I always like, like, I just imagine that's like what she imagined, the domestic alley, like the perfect American dream is just like to have this ownership of the house and land and like, mm -hmm. it's now like not attainable, like no one like, like me photographing her and then the context of these pictures mm -hmm. and she's just like so unaware about that that part of so yeah so was this image was this purposely made with the focal point being the house and her being out of focus uh yeah this i i wanted i think i made like two, 
three or four shots of, a scene of this, and like it was her face and focus in it. But it was more important like to show like what the picture was, like mm -hmm. that, that was behind her. I mean, and she's like shown up enough in this work that like, people can yeah. understand like who she is as a character, like this other person that's operating. And then like, yeah, I see her as like more like the precursor because she like I shared half her DNA. Mm -hmm. um, so she, it's in a way just like still photographing myself. And, having a homophobic mother in that part is kind of, yeah, this other thing that's happening. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, this was kind of made like really last minute and surprise. Like one of the things like, I think you touched upon a little bit is like just how like you're making these pictures and like as you go, like what, how do you know it's a good picture? How do you know? And I always like think of, I call it this, this surprise, like something just after you make it and you look at it again and there's something that just really stays with you longer and that's like that's really surprising that's what i kind of look for like, yeah. in my work too like yeah. that's what i want to keep mm -hmm. i found too like an editing process like with making a book or whatever like going through and scanning everything and digitizing where all of a sudden going back in time and looking at your content sheets again the surprises that you get seven years eight years ten years past you know where you don't see something right away and you meet your mind, the way you work, your process needs to kind of shift in a way where you can accept a certain thing. And like the easy <coughs> picture maybe you would win. And then the more complicated picture, a challenging picture, like the one of the camera like giving control. Yeah. Me not having control. Me giving my control over to this machine. That was like a really gratifying experience for me to have. And and I think it's just like this kind of relationship that I have with photography, the relationship that I have with the camera where like I trust it more than when I'm photographing myself, more though than I trust my own or my own self, yeah. how I would relate to the world or whatnot. Yeah. So it's just like if you stay at a place, like if you're talking about like re photographing um, places in your apartment that you're familiar, and then you just change the composition, you put the camera back, and it like looks different. And you know how you fit into that space. And like when the camera comes into play, it's like it's cutting off something, it's leaving something out. And that's just, but the most important thing is like you know where you can be in that, that frame, within that frame, like how the camera you see. It's like this. It's, it's such a weird struggle. Like, yeah. Is it really me or is it just the camera? Like, is it more the camera than my eye? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Something I really don't know how to answer. If that's something I want to, to answer. And something like um, goes into. Um, I guess we could talk about the book, man. Our book. Yeah, our book. But one other thing too uh, that I just wanted to mention also with like, which is kind of striking about your work too, and, and how you're kind of balancing this negotiating photographer and subject where you're allowing for it to be wide open, right? You're allowing for the landscape, all these like interior spaces, elvis, objects, whatever it might be to kind of enter into it. And maybe, and then negotiating a place where you can be both, like, and, and you don't have to be in front of the camera, where it's an impulse and you're making the picture, but a lot of people don't. It's so, it's such a different space to be entered into. And I'm thinking too about like your mom and how if we didn't, if we weren't sitting here, we weren't privy to like having this information. We know that it's your mother too, and the kind of psychology of the mother, the psychology of you and her, and just like what's happening in these images with you two, I think is so strong in like the narrative quality of it, and also the psychology, the psychology of it, right? And like with you not, her not knowing that you're gay, right? And that's like probably what motivates a lot of the work too, I would imagine. What motivates you going back and photographing with her? Yeah. And just for her to kind of gain some insight, or for her to like reflect on the images, are you trying to like use the images as a document for her to realize something? Like when she sees your work, how she responds to it, or is she like so cut off from reality or from accepting it that it's not part of the conversation? I think she's just like so much cut off from it. Like I, I don't really imagine. I actually, like showed her work of like when I was undergrad, and she had like the most strongest disinterest of looking at them. So when I make these pictures of us, I always imagine, I think it's very selfish for me, so like I'm making it for myself, really. Like, this is what I'm going to have, and then like she inevitably finds out. And, yeah, I don't, like, even like showing her, I don't think she, she doesn't have like the same relationship to photography. Um, she's fine with like things are like are very fleeting, or it's more about her being there in the moment rather than her, I mean, like she's never like... But she's like, I'm connecting with you in yeah. this moment or something. Yeah, she's less about having a coat, a disposable camera on her. Yeah, yeah. For those things. Yeah, it's it's just weird, like this, you know, like where we were talking about earlier. Um, 
the camera just like revealing, and especially doing it for so long. And you, you've been doing the project for 11 years, that's the title of your book. And this one is, I've probably been working this half the time that you were, and it's, as we go, like the camera, like placing the camera, and like that becoming so, so much of a need. The questions that I had, and I seek photography, I use photography to seek answers, mm -hmm. and so now it's like, how can I go back and reflect into that place, and go back and reflect into this like naive self, you know, it's like, Photography was like the outlet and what like kind of saved me of like realizing something about like change or about like immaturity. Like there was so much that like I learned from making that work. And it didn't I think it had to do with the trajectory of time and being eleven years. But yeah, reflection again, like we talk about reflecting on the work and talking about like looking at something with a different set of eyes and how important that is just to open you up too. Yeah. And so uh, I wanna like talk about your like newer pictures because this is the first time I've seen I seen I saw like a picture of you and Steven mm -hmm. um, from like our flyers. Like, oh, I've never seen this before. It's in the book. Um, and so I'm gonna try to use this as a transition to talk about like the book. because um, that's always like the like sort of ends a kind of project. And we were talking about this the other night in preparation for we like like does it it just feels weird for me like I did this book and it's like it doesn't really end like this project. It's actually half the body of work that's in this in, this, in my book. Because um, that's how much we can afford. Um, um, Do you guys want me to turn on the light? Should we turn on the light? Yeah, sure. To so see oh, the books and stuff? Okay. Make everybody up. Sorry. Um, yeah, I really talk, like, how is like, making your book? Like, you had, um, like, your gallery and all that um, um, helping you produce the book. Well, the fundraising. The fundraising is the book, too, that's just important. But, I don't know, I mean, it was, I worked on it for two years, you know, maybe even more than that. Like, 2010 is when I started making it, and then 2014 is when it came out. So 2010 is when I started scanning the work, basically, and thinking about conceiving the book. And everything kind of changed, and the whole, the whole body shift and what that happened, like, I think it's really important that it's part of the book, too, yeah. you know, and the kind of, narration of it and how it's not chronological, like the work that I presented tonight is from 2002 to 2014 or 15, but the book kind of allows it to break it, the space up a little bit and kind of have an introduction at the end, and it's about reflection too, and about, you know, time travel in a way. You know, time travel within a space where you presented something and then you can reflect, but you don't know the work, it's kind of confusing. But the editing was like the hardest part, that's probably what took me the longest too, to go down from having you know, 100 pictures or whatever it might be, to 55. Um, and so how images have to come back in and how images have to kind of have an importance and be part of it too. Yeah. Um, and how they could stand in for the other pictures that don't end up in the final sequence of the book. But yeah. they still exist in like exhibitions and shows and all that. Yeah. That's always like curious, like, I love like being a picture as it's an entity too. Um, I actually had the opposite of all that. Like, I said yes to doing this book summer and then had three months to produce it <laughs> and like I only had one and luckily like I had a trip to go back home to make like additional pictures because I wanted at least like people were at least somewhat familiar like at least my classmates and I ended up like panicking and then stalking people and then like running around and then trying not to get shot at again um, and trying to like make these new pictures that and then, I think like maybe four or five or the new, or new picture that I hadn't shown before. So this one's like part of that. Um, but yeah, I like the publishers just approached me. I didn't like I had lesser time, and it's like kind of weird to um, just like doing this book kind of ends this kind of project. But in a way, like we're still continuing it. Like I'm still working on some few pictures, and I'm working on another body of work, and you're doing the same as well. It's like can you talk about more of that? Yeah, I think that well, for one thing about the process of the book too, and titling and whatnot, where titling was like a really hard thing to kind of come about, because I've always just called the work of self-portraiture for whatever reason, and with titling, like I didn't, I felt like making a book is such an ending, right, it's like a, a stamp of being something ending and being done, and I didn't want to have that be part of the work, and so, or part of my process, so I felt that titling it with a number, titling with a year, 11 years, can be, I don't feel like I'll ever stop photographing myself, like there's times when I'm really looking at myself or looking at a relationship or my relationships and other times where I'm not interested. And so to kind of place it in time and context of time because the work is all about sequential time as well, that 
it had to be part of it too, where it didn't, it wasn't like it was an ending point for me. Yeah. And that's like the fear that I have now when I make a picture where it feels like super redundant. It's like that's my big challenge I'm having right now of working where I can make a picture and it feels like something I've already made or there's nothing interesting about it or I've lost my subject matter, I've lost my talent, you know, all these things that we deal with with making, being artists, being photographers, where there's that balance that has to come into place. But, um, but the title of it had to do with being able to like extend it so the project's not over. And if I work another 10 years or 12 years or 15 years and then if there's like a sequel, that's how I was like thinking about it too, where I can look at myself in this chapter and the next chapter. And I feel like there is like semi-chapters that are happening in the book with the body shift and that's why in the beginning it's it's that m amount of pictures that are uh, examining that essay and then the rest of the pictures of like the reflection. Yeah, I, know, I love that idea. And you really, I'm going to touch on something that you said, um, kind of mentioned, I'm trying to like wrap my head around it because I'm like losing my words as I go, uh -huh. as I'm saying this. Um, yeah, I lost my train of thought. There we go. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. <laughs> so, like, what about like for your, for your instance? So you've been working on this project for since 2009 or so? For 2011, 10, 11? so like four years. So four years. Yeah. So how, I mean, how did the, have you always been working with breaking in like interior spaces and like thinking about this really duality of the photographer being in front of the camera and behind the camera? That was like most of like what this project, like I wanted to make the, these pictures before, because before then it's just like, um, either had a body of work where people are kissing me and they're kind of really repetitive and the only impact of that body of work, the, the kind of surprise, is this, like there's so much of it and people were able to analyze like the different types of kisses and these secondary gestures that are happening. And I didn't want to continue doing like that, that kind of same setup, the same process of like me and then there's a performance and then there's the action and then capturing it and then the whole body of work is only realized when you look at all the pictures at once. And I wanted to make these pictures that could be, could, that could be taken out of context and be seen it in a way, like, and it's how I feel as a person. Like, if you look at an individual picture rather than a body of work, it just becomes, like, the context shifts and it changes. Um, but yeah, it, I would, and I did, wasn't thinking about do, making this into a book, like, at all, at this whole time I'm doing it. I'm just, like, making pictures existing and hope and pray that I have, like, some kind of exhibition, like, at one point, and people are like, yeah, it's great, it's relevant, yeah. But I think too, when I look, think about the, do you guys know the pictures of like when he's like kissing people? Are you familiar with these works? And then also like the Atlas video that you did, the Atlas Shit. pictures of men, men, all men, yes, or women too? No, all athletic men and women. They're oh, mostly women. Too. Men. Yeah, so like said. athletic men and women like lifting you and like mm -hmm. pressing you and squatting with you, right? They're squatting. Yeah, they're like just throw me. They, I call it Lois leaning, and so they throw me over their shoulder, and then they just squat you. Yeah. Uh huh. <laughs> Amazing. And like um, that work, and then the other kissing pictures. Not not so much really in in the work that you present tonight, but like what your relationship to of like being an exhibitionist is as well. Because like that work is like about being touched. You know, that work is about like having an exchange. That work is about like physicality. Yeah. This is very different entity, you know, this is very different in the way that you're just, the way that you're even dealing with photographic space, you know, yeah. you talked about the kissing pictures being all at night, the men, the people lifting you, it's video, it's, it's a different kind of performance, like the performance is already in state because of the mechanism of the video, too, yeah. and so I guess the question is for you, is just like, how do you kind of deal with, like, yourself, and like, and the kind of exhibitionist kind of quality of how you enter these men or these people that you're working with? It's weird that you bring that up, because I, like, I always think, like video and photography, I've always separated them and never was able to figure out how to. I like presenting them together as, as much as I can. It's really rare that that happens. And and so, like the video work and photography kind of operate se like separately all the time, but there's always like, usually with me in it and playing some kind of role. And I don't know, I always felt like the video portion, especially Atlas, was very much um, based on my earlier way of like how I, how I made pictures. With the kissing and, pictures? Yeah, especially that. I like the idea of like repetition and seriality to in video, and then there's movement happening, but it was kind of like more of an extension of like, um, 
like examining this deadpan character because I can kind of continue. Yeah, exactly. That kind of um, I think of it as a character rather than or, or kind of um, a trademark, this kind of characteristic that happens that you see in the photographs. But that that deadpan character kind of remains like not is like is there, but it's not. It doesn't take up so much space in every picture that you see. Mm -hmm. And so that had to go somewhere, and that ended up being my videos. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I think that's like the, like where it came, and like yeah. video just was able like I was just I could explore more like what this kind of character did move, and I could talk too. I was able to like have a voice. Um, but yeah, that's like usually like that's like my, how I see my relationship with video photography right now. Well, it's interesting too because like that work, it's quote unquote stage, right? Like yeah. you have a camera and a tripod yeah. for both situations, but the men or the people that you're kissing and also the people that are lifting you. This is the same similar situation where it's camera and tripod, it's very staged, but just the overall feeling of them because of the humor or the tongue in cheek or whatever you want to call it, um, element in that work, it's like, it's it's easier, you know, where this, you're like challenging someone to like, look at you, yeah. look at your mother, look at this home, look at Elvis, and like, again, it's like the kind of, the sexual connotation that Elvis kind of brings up, and this yeah. male stereotype of this kind of masculine, like women throwing their panties and bras and like, you like that, you know, yeah. and then and then that's filtered and yes, it's from Memphis and whatnot, but I feel like there's more than that besides just like being rough place. Yeah, it's, it's just, I'm still figuring it out. I, I think I now remember what I wanted to bring up earlier is this idea of struggling, because this, like I wanted it to be really challenging, obviously, and humor was such like an easy thing for me to do, at least, and I mean, I, I think I knew how to do it, and I think I still to be funny, I guess, um, and yeah, I think it was like, when you have like humor, when I have humor in my work, it was easy for people, like I was able to, if someone laughed, I understood that they knew something about the picture that I wanted them to, to know, and I wanted to make that like, like still be there in my work, but also like not happening at the same time, because sometimes there's a joke, but do you, do you get the joke or do you get the punchline, and that's like, that's like happening, and this is like, Oh my God! What's happening? Why am I making these pictures? And I wanted to make these that kind of work to just not make it easy on myself. I wanted to struggle. I wanted. I still want to. Like, how do you just make pictures? Again? Like, I was trying to relearn that. And, you know, and like, I'm doing it as I go. And you're being, you're more reflective. You're more like looking back. And, but you're also now making these new pictures. This new body of work is like you know, being like, I'm trying to. God, it's hard. It's hard. Um, yeah, should we open it up for questions and stuff? Yeah. Hi. We didn't Here forget we about you. We didn't forget about you. That's easy. <laughs> so this became like way before the book that I thought about the process of their ability to make a book or whatnot but there's something about when I was making the pictures and from like an early stage like I was thinking like oh I'm going to photograph myself and they're only for me right it was just in the beginning there was I was in school there was like a critique you know that I was part of and people were looking at them but then for a good year I was just like making them and looking at them only for myself but again like thinking about why am I doing this? Like, what are these impulses? What is the point of me doing this as well? Um, and then I started to kind of going to like, you know, SPE or different like conventions or not because I wanted to kind of, I wanted to be a working photographer and working artist. And I was ready to kind of show the work to an, and have an audience around it. And I realized like about it too. I couldn't just like make this picture and like hide it in a closet, you know? And like, that was like part of the challenge of it too, was like having to be able to develop a a voice around it, but because there was this otherness to the work, and I think we both kind of, we both kind of go into this this vein where the projection of self was so in the photographs was so different than how I approached the world or how I projected myself in the world. I was able to kind of desensitize myself from that person, um, and so because of that, I was able to like have a dialogue around it, and the work 
I started to enter it into certain things and whatnot and had some exposure to it. And I have to say, like, the first time I had the work in an exhibition, I was, like, so scared. You know, I was, like, so vulnerable and I didn't know what to do or how to talk about it. And then over time, I kind of, de it, de it developed, you know, I developed, like, a tougher skin around it, too, of having that dialogue. But the book came much later as a, it, it, it had to do with, like, closure or putting something where it felt like it had been at that point nine years, and it felt like there was, that it was able to become something of an object. Like, I felt like I could put it in this form, I could put it into this book, and it can become an object, and it can be about, like, myself. And uh, I felt, too, that there was almost like a universal quality to the work that other people can understand, where it didn't have to just be, like, for this artistic kind of world. Or, you know, it, it could kind of reach out and be a little bit something where, other people can understand the struggle. You know, it wasn't like a self-help book in any sense of the words, but it was something where I felt that it could reach someone outside of just like the artistic kind of world, so I wanted to get it out with that reason too. So you talk about not knowing how to speak about your work when you first showed it, but you talk really well about your work now. Um, do you think it's just the process of working for so long on the same subject, or is there Anything else that yeah, I think, you did? Yeah, I think, um, well, for one, I think like grad school really uh, got us to be able to talk about our work because we were really kind of responsible. We had this structure where you're responsible to like present your work, responsible to speak of it and whatnot. And I, well, if, if this was the first time I talked about it, I would be not be able to speak about it in just such a way. But it was just about like, like I said, like kind of taking ownership of it and like really understanding what these impulses were, really understanding what I wanted to communicate with these pictures, and really separating myself. Like there is such an otherness that I like deal with in when I'm like making a picture, when I'm talking about it, versus like how it relates to someone. So, and it was just like a process since it is 11, 12 years of work that I've learned things through it and I've been able to kind of discuss it in a different way. How do you, you uh, Jen, you asked, um, tell me about exhibitionism, but how do you both address the subject of narcissism? you know, and sustaining mm -hmm. long projects of self portraiture mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's something that I really struggled with in dealing with the kind of notion of being a narcissist or a notion of, of someone uh, criticizing me for being that, where in my, my understanding of myself was that I was far from that, you know, that I was far from anyone even pigeonholing me, putting me into that category that and, and still at this point too, it's like I, in, in the beginning as well, I was like really insecure and really um, inhibited by someone saying, critiquing my work, saying it was self-centered or saying, I mean the first show that I was in was called Self-Centered. <laughs> and I was like, oh fuck. <laughs> what, is, what am I getting myself into, you know, like this is what they're categorizing me as. But I feel like I was able to, I was able to separate myself from it because I didn't believe that like, I had a trait of any kind of narcissistic tendency or that I was so far beyond even loving or accepting that I could separate the two from each other. Yeah. I'm also like, in comparison to people like hold out their phones to take pictures of themselves, I think like that is the opposite end of like what I'm trying to do and like I'm trying to figure a lot of things out and there's, for me, it's, I don't, I, there is a, yeah, I'm not going to deny the sense of narcissism. Sure. Right? Like, you turn the camera to yourself and you're the subject, but I feel like we both have something to say about our own experiences that not a lot of people get to see in the art world. I mean, only, what, 50 years ago that we started getting more women artists, or they started being recognized or written into canon. Before then, it's like almost non-existent. They were there, but they were barely talked about. And what we're doing now is just like we continue our own practice. It, it, it might seem narcissistic, but... I don't think it's, I don't think it operates, I don't think it, in that vanity, mm -hmm. I, don't, I think it has to do with vanity, you know, mm -hmm. and for me to do, like, when I showed, like, like a bunch of terrible self-portraits, and my first critique at Yale, it was, someone looked at it, it's like, well, this is honest, it's like, is that another way of saying self-centered? <laughs> <laughs> and I think, like, and I feel like that's, like, just another way of, that's just code. Like, mm -hmm. people are just going to say something they really mean the other way. 
Mm -hmm. I think it's all like acceptable, and I think it shouldn't be denied from the work. Yeah, I think too, it's an interesting point that you bring up about like the, the selfie or like the kind of you know recording of self. Now that it's accessible for anyone to who has a cell phone or iPhone or whatever. Where I mean, I was on train the other day, um, like an Amtrak train or whatever, not the MTA. And this woman like saw a beautiful light on her, and she responded, and she was like took her phone, and she was you know, and I was like. How amazing is it that this woman sees the light? Like this, this woman is like aware of like, oh, there's really nice light on me. It's time for herself. Um, I would be in my apartment and be like, oh, the light's great. I got to take a picture. You know? I just and I was over. like, <laughs> I'm just like, I'm light. No, I don't want to get up. Yeah, you're like, ah. no, but it was kind of amazing too to like think about the mainstream and how people are like attuned to these yeah. things now, and they're like gonna like post a picture and like hashtag like morning light or something. Yeah. yeah, and I think it has to do with like conscious. Like I don't think she she might not be a photographer, but no, no, like, absolutely. Become, yeah. they're starting to become like a, in great and yeah. whatnot. I think that was pretty cool. Like it was kind of amazing. I was like, oh more people that way. Photography, everyone's a photographer. <laughs> Uh, you said something earlier, Tony, about how it drove you crazy, selfies, and you were going to mention something about it. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, no. I just, like, I, I don't know. That was just only when I, like, my relationship with selfies has always been, like, I, I guess I, I do it. Like, I have an Instagram account for it that's made, like, where that work came from. And I always think it's just, shares very similar language to self-portraiture. Like, it, like, I think it's such a... I don't know. I don't really want to do it, anything in that in that vein, but I, I need to start looking at it. And it's something I'm trying to consider for my work, or like my next body of work. And it's just weird. Like I think of it as like more of like a mirror. Like uh, what we're talking. I was telling you, like I was explaining to Jen the other night, like what my relation, what I think is the difference between selfie and self-portraiture is the idea of distance and how it's, it's pretty much essentially a mirror. Like the time, like we set up our our camera on the tripod or set the camera up, it's, and we don't get to see our, our, the pictures immediately. Like, we have to wait to get to a computer or, like, see the negative. And for people doing selfies, it's like the idea, that's the difference, is the idea of distance. Mm -hmm. I don't feel like a lot of people talk about that and treat it, like, I think, like, the smartphones are just basically mirrors, like, mm -hmm. ourselves. Like, that's the difference, and I don't think, like, people tend to consider that so much. And, and that's how I'm going to try to make get that into my my practice. Mm -hmm. I think it's interesting too how like people, men and women, like teenagers, you know, adults, whoever, like they're curating their identity. Yeah. You know, they're curating a specific kind of life that they want to that they want to share with the world. You know, they're like choosing their representation. They're like seeing they're so in, like they're it's so immediate. You yeah. know, that's like the challenging part about it too, where there's no surprises. There's appointment, but this, what they're using it for is completely different as well. But yeah. it's just like it is about like a life factor, or it is about you know I was here, I did this, I experienced this, and yeah. you, and now I can broadcast it to my feed. And people are just you know that's part of society now, and you can't get it away from it. You know you can't like avoid it. You can't like not be part of it too. Yeah, you know? it's weird because we're engaged in it. We both have Instagrams. We both have these things. Like we have these fo these phones that make these things called pictures. Yeah. And it's but we're also like operating in our own part of the world, like our own like mythology that we have actually come from a long line of tradition of camera picture making, like that kind of thing. And in comparison, it's like everyone else is doing it. We're doing like our thing that could just be seen like prehistoric in a sense. It's like, oh, you still shut down? That's so cool! Wow. That's so hip! <laughs> I just want to be hip. Can I just be hip? <laughs> you are. No, you are. Do you, do you think that the selfie uh, trend, or at least the, uh, this embrace of like independent like life curation, you know, let's just say if that's what it is, is going gonna, is gonna to continue for a long time, or are we at kind of like, maybe it's like a bubble, and eventually... I think it's still going to continue in the background. It's going to... Like, people are still doing it, I think. Yeah. And, like, I've never seemed to pay attention to it anymore. Like, other people are doing it, I'm doing my thing, and, like, you're doing your thing. I, I don't... I, like, how could it not? Yeah. You know, that's the thing I'm thinking about. Like, how could it not propel to something else? Or, 
whatever technology happens, you know, whatever comes of it, like I don't, and just like how celebrity, celebrity is using it too, and how their role of the selfie, um, Kim Kardashian, or who else? I can't think of anyone else besides Beyonce. Her. Beyonce, sure, Beyonce. Beyonce. All those Kardashians. Um, but just like the kind of global scale of it too, I just can't imagine it not being part of our identity or our yeah. How people kind of embrace technology of their phones or Instagram. Or photography phones. itself. It's yeah. like, you know, I, I feel like, yeah, I think it's, it's bringing a lot more into photography to play. It's like it's a lot more accessible than it was like 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And like people, it's just now it's on the phone and like in a different language and in this certain kind of language too. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. But um, why do you think that um, while self portraiture has proliferated among women. There's so few men who do it. I don't, I don't think that's true. I think it's like, like it's been a long line, long, a long line of it. Um, but yeah, there's Cindy Sherman, obviously, and Claire Lynn that, um, that predates her, and who else? A lot of people. Ann Collier, even like her. God, I saw her show at H. Uh, at, the Art Gallery of Ontario is amazing. Um, but yeah, I've always like, I think it's like been treated at when male photographers photograph themselves and it's usually, I've always like noticed that there's a pattern that they're always like more implied to be the photographer, like that was their role rather than like anything else. Like they weren't able to do be anything else. And usually that like skipped a case with saying Kwon Chi, but he was also like race might have been played to be able to do that. I think with women, they had just, or photographers have, like, had access to a, di a deeper language where their body could en encompass. Like, mm -hmm. Sydney Sherman, for example, is like her being in a, in, a, in a woman body, like, was able to talk about things that are happening in cinema. And she was able to do that while Andy Warhol just used his fame to, and, like, I'm the photographer making this picture. And that was like, that's like the difference I see. Mm -hmm. I think there's always been, like, male photographers, but they're just, or self-portrait, the no, male photographers that use self-portrait with but just is like, I mean, the only other person I can think of that is Lee Friedlander. They're such shadows. Yeah, stuff. I mean, I think too, it's like, maybe it's a question of like, a man's masculinity being challenged too, where it's like, John Copeland, who photographed himself right. in an aging body too, where he was like, being very vulnerable, like his work, and showing his age, showing his skin, showing his sexuality, like, it's totally exposed. Like, I don't think a lot of times, like, men, heterosexual men, homosexual men, whatever it might be, are, like, able to kind of engage in that. There's just, like, they're, whatever it might be, I feel like women are more about exploring their bodies, exploring their sexuality, exploring themselves, and it's been so far, so far as I feel like when I look at men who are yeah. working. They're very, yeah, they're, like, male, especially white male, heterosexual white males were dominant so much and like seeing this other thing that's happening that has always been happening, it just, I think women like, I, I really honestly think women just do it better. <laughs> yeah. And then are like, like the masculine role of like being behind the camera too. Mm -hmm. And like, I'm interested in that too, of just like objectification, you know, of like a man photographing a woman, but what, and I feel like when I'm photographing men, it's like a project that I've done, like I'm, I'm assuming the same role, yeah. you know, I'm like, I'm looking at them and I'm objectifying them, I'm like, it's not the reality of the situation, it's like this fabricated image that comes, a fabricated photograph that comes out of a shoot, you yeah. know, 10 pictures or 20 pictures, whatever it might be, um, but that role of like the gaze and the role of like ownership too, I think is something that's interesting, the difference between the two sexes as well. Yeah, definitely. Any more questions? Um. Jen, can you talk a little bit about, it seems like most of your images are inside, interior mm -hmm. shots, and I was just wondering like where you're going now with your work, if you're shooting more outside, if you're taking yourself outside. And uh -huh. Yeah, I haven't really been photographing myself recently. I've been kind of transitioning and I for a while and trying to look at like the female form, like being like, okay, so I had this experience, I made this book, I my body transformed, I'm interested in like, it came to a point where I was looking at older pictures and there were these pictures, two in particular women, um, that I made when I was like traveling on the road. And, and I was interested in 
or I started to think about like, well, why have I never photographed women? Like, why have they not been a part of my subject matter? It's always been me or men or my relationship to men or whatever it might be. And so I and I had this like big life changing experience where I wanted to look at that at like transformation in general. Um, and I met this competitive female bodybuilder. And I met her, and then I met her again in like two months where she just started, and her body completely like transformed, and her lifestyle and everything. And I started to talk to her, and I started to talk to other women and photograph other women who were in a similar place. And it's all about control. It's all about like food. And they come from like former um, disorders, eating disorders, or control issues, or whatever. Um, and so I would, not all of them, I'm not generalizing, but most of them who I had spoken to personally. And so I was interested in that, and I was interested in like how now what is this idea of beauty, and what is this idea of transformation, and what is like where can you go beyond? Like when do you reach that highest point? And I'm interested in also like these women how they're like getting on stage and, and trying to find perfection, and they're performing, and they're best little slices when they're not aware, you know, photograph when they're not performing. And same with like the video that I'm trying to the video kind of work that I'm going towards right now where. You know, I want to see, like, the, not the glamorous side of it, but, like, when they break, you know, or, like, when they're in, when they're tan, when they're all tan and performing and they depleted of food and water and they take pills that hydrate themselves and they're, like, totally out of it. Like, I want that, like, mode. So, yeah, that's kind of where my mind is at now for, like, continuing some things. And I think it's definitely related to, like, my story. And not as because, of, just, like, my story of, of being interested in the body, being interested in, like, relationship to myself, relationship to men, relationship to the world at large. And then now again like going back to like, oh I can identify with this in a certain way. Yeah, and I want to understand that. You know, and I want to use photography to understand that and that's a challenging thing. So you're signing and selling those books? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Tommy's <laughs> book is hot off the press. <laughs> this book came delivered FedEx here this, today, yeah? This afternoon? Yeah. yeah. There's yeah. like a lot of hiccups. Um, but it's arrived. Yeah, there, these only have 10, and these will be, um, next week is the official release of these, and like, they'll be sent to the mail. It's like, um, so if you want them now, they're like 40 bucks, and I'll sign them, and I'll personalize them, and I'll probably hug you, but. <laughs> Are you taking plastic? Yes, I actually am. They sent me this thing, and I think I know how to work it. I'm Asian, and I can do this. <laughs> so thank you, thank you everyone for coming. Thank you.